I am one of the pastors here. Uh, you may be wondering, and you could go ahead and take a seat for a moment, but then stand back up because we're gonna continue worshiping. You may be wondering, why are you wearing swim shorts right now? No, it is not my way of rebelling against the weather, but rather we have baptisms happening this Sunday. Baptism, yes. Baptism is 
incredibly profound way of us recognizing that we are liberated from sin. Jesus calls us and saves us from sin and and we are, are buried with him in baptism and raised to life, new life with him. This is what we celebrate with baptism. And we have several people getting baptized. So here's what I want us to do. When you see someone get baptized as we're in worship, just celebrate, just you know, clap your hands as hard as you can, give us shouts, and we are going to make this a celebratory experience. So would you stand to your feet? And we're gonna continue worshiping as we do baptisms right now.
Lord, we praise you for your goodness. Thank you for each and every individual who got baptized today. May you fill them with your spirit and empower them by your spirit for ministry, for, for serving the world wherever they are, whether it's school or, or their neighborhood, their home, their workplace. May each and every one remember this day and follow you, follow you all the days of their life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. What a good day. You may take a seat. Is it just me or is it a little chilly in here? <laughs> Slightly chilly. Oh, hi, Jenna. Believe it or not, but we are a couple of months away from summer, and during the summer here at the church, we have uh, this thing called camp. We have day camp for the kids, fifth grade and under, and we have middle school camp and high school camp. So with me, I've got Pastor Jenna, Pastor Morgan, and Pastor Cassandra, who are going to be leading the, the kids, the middle school, the high school camps, respectively. And uh, yeah, so Jenna, tell us uh, a, a little bit about like, you know, if you could sum up camp in like one phrase, what is it that kids love about camp? And then how can people get involved? Yeah, yeah. Um, we are so excited. The thing to know about camp, if you can't tell, is it's the theme is start the party. So we're going to celebrate. I'm not just completely insane. I mean, I'm fun, but you know, um, but we're going to start the party, which means we're going to celebrate the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this whole place is going to be filled with 360 kids singing, dancing, playing games, getting to know Jesus, making friends. It's amazing. We do water slides and the list goes on. And the, like a party. it is literally a party. Yeah. It disco balls and everything. So it's going to be awesome. It's July 8th through the 11th. And the thing to know is today is the day that registrations open. So it's today at two o'clock and you can go to b4church.org slash day camp to sign up, set your alarms, moms and dads or grandparents or whoever signing up and be ready because it fills up fast. Um, and the way to get involved is volunteer. We need around 200 people to volunteer um, all day roles part-time roles, hospitality, greeters, all sorts of things. And so there's ways for you to jump in for a little bit or commit to the whole week. Um, either way, it's going to be a life-changing experience for kids in our area. And so please join us. Amazing. Morgan, tell us a, a little bit about middle school camp. Well, for both middle school and high school this year, we are not doing our normal Youth for the City camp here at our campus. We are going over through the 22nd. And I would just say, like, camp is everyone's favorite week of the summer. I mean, it was my favorite week of the summer growing up, and it still is. So you can also get involved if you would like to get involved. And we need counselors. We need people to run games. We need hospitality people. We, there's so many different ways that you guys can get involved in camps. It's not just by being a counselor. So if you're scared of being a counselor, it's okay. You can serve in a lot of different other ways. But we also need counselors. So... Pray about it. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, we want you guys to be a part of it. For high school, it is um, July 24th to the 28th, and we are going to McClay Conference and Retreat Center in Salem, which is so fun and gorgeous, and there's a pool, and we'll have a team comp, of course, because what else are we going to do at camp, and have extended time of worship together, be in cabins together, and truly just get to get away for a week and spend time um, deepening relationships uh, with one another and with God. So it's going to be super, super fun. We're really, really excited, and we want you to be a part of it if you're like, oh, I'm not a high school student. I don't serve with youth. You're counting yourself out already. Pause. Count yourself in. We want you there. So join us, pray about it, come talk to us, and we'd love to have you there. And when is registration opening? Registration opens next Sunday, the 14th. So it'll be on the website. If you're getting emails, you will get an email with all the information. Amazing. Well, uh, please pray about uh, serving with us in one of these or all of these camps. And uh, here's, here's really the reason why we do this. It's not just because we like, you know, uh, you know, wild games and, you know, late nights. I especially don't like late nights. But 
we do this because we want to see students experience uh, a weekend, or not a weekend, a week away, uh, particularly overnight for middle school and high school and for kids uh, being here, to experience some time to, to really hear from the Lord, hear the good news, the gospel, and find their place in the grand redemptive story of God. That is why we do this, uh, and it is so much fun. So we highly encourage you to pray about it and join in on the fun. So uh, with that being said, uh, pray about it. And would you uh, draw your attention to the screen for church news? Good morning, Before Church. I'm Weber. And I'm Abby. We are so glad to have you here with us today. Here are some things that we've got coming up. For all the parents in the room, we have an all elementary faith journey event for parents with kids K through fifth. This will be held April 14th during the 9 a.m. service. Head to b4church.org slash faith journey for more details. Serving on a team is a great way to get connected and also to grow in your faith. Our goal is to help you find and develop the unique gifts and passions that God has given you. To learn more about serving or how to join a team, visit b4church.org slash join a team or stop by the info center after service. It's about that time again for another shelter worship night. Come join us in worship and prayer together. Mark your calendars for April 10th. We will have dinner together at 5.30 p.m. and begin worship at 6.30. To learn more about upcoming events and all the weekly things we have going on, like Before Culture, our men's Bible study, young adults, and more, head to beforechurch.org. That's all we have for today. We hope you have a great service, and we will see you next time. guys. Excuse me. It's good to see you this morning. I'm Bo. I'm one of the pastors here. Ushers, if you want to come on forward. Bye, middle school. We love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh, middle school and high school meet Tuesday nights at seven if you have a middle schooler or a high schooler. And they, they are that awesome. So you should definitely do that if you are a middle schooler or a high schooler. Um, we want to continue to worship through our giving Baptism just always does me in. If you look around at the staff during baptism, we're all such a mess because we know these lives and we see how God has blessed and touched and drawn them to himself. And it's such a beautiful thing. And then talking about camp, where I feel like I've, my, my life was changed in a bunch of summer camps growing up. I was called to ministry in summer camp. And so everything that you give goes toward life change. And we're so, so grateful. And regarding serving at camp, don't even pray about it. Just just do it. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably not the right thing to say. I'm a pastor. I take it back, but honestly do it. Um, Jesus, thank you for blessing our giving. We love you so much. We thank you for every penny. We thank you for every moment that we're able to give and bless and serve. God, I thank you for every heart in this room and for everything you've done already in this service. You've already spoken. We already owe you more than we could pay. And so we just thank you that you're going to bless everything that's given and every heart heart that gives. In your name we pray. Amen. You can pass those buckets. A um, couple of things coming up I want you to know about next weekend is Pastor Alex's last Sunday with us. And he, we're, I know we're, we're going to, we'll cry then too, but we're so excited for him. It's such a great opportunity and such a good, it's, it's just a, the right kingdom move for Alex to take the lead position at Willamette Christian Center. And so he's going to have next week, we're going to do a little farewell for him and he's going to preach and um, then the next weekend I'll be here and then the next weekend I'm going to his installation service at Willamette and I wanted to give somebody a chance to to kind of get their speaking wings going and stuff so we've got Randy Remington coming we thought that'd be good <laughs> We're just gonna like he has potential. He has, <laughs> we think he should he should just give it a try. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Randy was the pastor of this church for a long, long time, and he is a great speaker and a great minister and communicator, a lover of the word, a communicator of the gospel. He's wonderful. Don't miss that on April twenty eighth. Um, I have been immersed in this theme of gardens. We've been talking about it a lot here at B4, that this is a garden and good things grow here. And 
we uh, feel like the, we are the seed and the seed falls in the ground and dies and then it's able to spring up and produce more and more fruit and flowers and beauty and goodness and life. And so today, we're going to move through the Bible. We're going to start in Genesis at the beginning and then we're going to swing by Isaiah real quick and then we're going to end up in our faithful companion John where we've been for the last few weeks and what we're going to see is a connected principle through the word of God through the whole of scripture I can't I don't have time to go to all the places where you will see this principle but it is a really important one for us to start with it's really important for when we talk about discipleship the idea of becoming more like God, the idea of becoming a more healthy, whole, flourishing soul, when we start, we start here. This is the place where we start, and this is also the place where we end. This one principle carries us into a better life, a life that is um, full and flourishing and what God wants it to be. So God says in the beginning, we see him say, let there be, let there be light, let there be planets, let there be baboons, I don't know why, let there be tree frogs, let there be ecosystems, let there be skeletal systems, let there be sun and moon and galaxies and stars, so many stars. He speaks these things into existence and in, we argue a lot in Christianity about how God created the world and I think sometimes that makes us miss the fact that just this line let there be, just this line, God created, is a radical faith statement. It's a radical statement about who God is. It tells us that God who was not a part of creation because he created it, but he was also not far from creation because he created it. So when we say, when I say, let God created the heavens and the earth, I am also saying, Bo didn't create the heavens and the earth. Bo isn't the creator, and so I also don't have control. I'm making a statement about who he is and also about who I am. And that is a big thing because there were all, Moses wrote the creation story, and he wrote it to a culture. And that culture had lots of creation stories. There was lots of mythology. Lots of people talked about how the worlds were created by other gods. And every one of those stories had a god that created humanity to be his slave. Created humanity to do all the work. Created humanity to toil under the anger of that God. And this is the one story where the God creates humanity for companionship as the object of his love and affection. It says this in Genesis 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God forms man out of what? Out of dust. God forms man out of dust. And that and you know what, Eden? I don't know. I don't know if your parents named you prophetically. Ah, <laughs> Eden fans. But I feel it is prophetic over your life. You are a place where God can bring peace for many people. You are a place where God is gonna show up and you're gonna be able to welcome people into the peace of God, not the peace of Eden, but the peace of God. And I just see his hand on your life for that and want you to know it. Um, so, dust. It was funny because I saw you in the baptismal tank and I was trying to remember your name because I felt this word for you. I was like, what, what is your name? What is your name? And I asked who, I, over here and I, he was like, that's Eden. And I was like, of course it is. Of course it is. Eden. Um, <laughs> there she goes. That's my grandbaby. She comes from a long line of noisy women. So <laughs> we love that about her. <laughs> love you, Ren Ren. <laughs> um, so God creates man out of the dust. He creates humanity out of the dust. And I've wondered sometimes why dust? Dust is so boring and small. And insignificant, I mean, dust is what we spend our lives trying to get rid of. And God creates humanity out of dust. He could have picked like a cloud, just pull a corner off a cloud and breathe a little breath into it. He could have picked mountain snow. He could have picked stardust. 
But instead, he picks dust, something so foundational to our planet, something so foundational to our lives, but so tiny and insignificant. Dust in the Hebrew is the word apar, and it means dry earth, dust, powder, ashes, earth, ground, rubbish. But then he breathes his breath into the dust. And that word means breath of God, the animating, activating power of God that turns dust to life. This is the creation story, how he takes humans from nothing and breathes his own breath into us so that we can become everything that he had always meant for us to become. He introduces this humble reality that we are made of dust, but then... He gives us his breath. And the smallness of dust isn't bad because all of creation is a work of love. The dust is a work of love and the breath is a work of love. We are the objects of his affection. We are the creation of his love. So we can't say dust is bad and breath is good or vice versa. Both of these things are good. They're God. Julia Canlis in her book, Theology of the Ordinary, says God's gift to humanity in the Garden of Eden is the space to be itself, to be a creature of God and not to be a puppet or a slave of God. In this creation narrative, to be a creature is the highest honor as it implies God's ongoing commitment to as creator. To be a creature is as much a statement about God as it is about us. And then into our dusty frames, he breathes the breath of life, and he stamps his own image. Genesis 1.27 said, let us create man in our image. So he stamps the imago Dei, the embedded picture of him inside our soul, inside who we are. And that gives us this beautiful, mysterious combination of the dust of the earth and the breath of God. This gives us humility, but also significance. And the humility here is in our limitations, Dust has limits. We, that side of our nature has limits. We are humans who need to sleep eight hours a night. We are humans who need to drink and eat to survive. We need companionship and love to survive. We need these things because we are limited. We're not the creator. And so we need these, these things, and that puts limits on us, and those limits are actually a gift. We often look at limitations as we've got to figure out a way to fix them. I gotta figure out a way to be more. I've gotta figure out a way to do more. I've gotta figure out a way to live on two hours of sleep. I've gotta figure out a way to push harder. Even sometimes in the church, we preach that message. You gotta change your world. But actually, the limitations are good for us because they remind us that we can't control things. They remind us that we need God. They keep us connected to the power and the breath of life that we so desperately need. The breath gives us life. The dust set some limits on us. Maybe it's a good idea to take a moment and think of your limitations and stop being mad at them. Maybe just think of the things that limit you and say, okay, that's gonna drive me further into the presence of God. I need to meet with God because I I have these limits. I can't do everything. I can't fix everything. I can't be everything on my own. So that's the creation story, dust and breath. And then we move, a f- we move forward to about 800 BC and the prophet Isaiah says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners uh, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow beauty on them, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Do you see the garden happening? They're gonna be called the planting of the Lord, and they're gonna grow up and display the beauty of the Lord to their world. When he says the spirit of the Lord is on me, this word spirit is the Hebrew word ruah, and it means breath. The breath of the Lord is upon me. The breath of God is in me. The breath of the Lord is in my dust. 
And it enables me to see the world as something that it isn't right now. It enables me to see beauty where there were ashes. That word ashes is the word dust. It enables me to see uh, healing and, and flourishing and joy where there was sorrow and dancing where there was only despair. It enables me to understand that God is at work in this. There's this dynamic, this life-giving healing that comes to our world as we begin to let the breath of God fill us and come through us. And then that little section ends, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. So again, we see the prophesied breath of God coming to our dust to create beauty and splendor and dancing and flourishing. Sign me up for that. That sounds good. And so fast forward eight centuries, we go to creation, we go to Isaiah, and then we go to Jesus. Jesus comes through the middle of all history, steps right onto our timeline, and takes on our dust. He becomes human. He wears our flesh. He wears our sorrow. He gets thirsty and hungry and tired. He, he willingly submits to the limitations of humanity so that he can become for us what we have never had, so, so that he can become redemption for us. And so in Luke 4, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And I don't, this isn't theology, this is just something that I notice in this story that it, that's evocative and beautiful to me that, that the children of Israel are freed by God and they go into the wilderness and are tested in for 40 years. And then Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he is tempted for 40 days. And so I'm, really interested in the idea of a wilderness. In this geography, the wilderness is desert. It's dry, it's not pleasant, it's barren, it's bleak and stark. And this is where Jesus finds himself. This is where the children of Israel find themselves. The wilderness is almost always symbolic of a time in our life that is trying and hard, a time that feels full of limitations. And Jesus also has been fasting for 40 days. And so he has pushed against his own limitations. He has removed himself from the government of food and walked into this experience with another power. And in that time, Satan comes to him and works really hard to create all kinds of diversions for him out in the dust. And I find that's what happens to us too when we're alone and lonely and we're living in this dust world. It's just easy to try to create your own distractions. How do I create my own counterfeit life here? It doesn't look like the good life or the whole life or the flourishing life, but I try to create something that looks like life out here. Life or um, dust minus breath is always gonna be death and despair. Breath plus dust is always gonna be life. The breath of God plus anything is gonna be life. And so when we are in a wilderness time, I, most people don't say I'm just really in a wilderness season and I'm having the time of my life. It's awesome. Usually it's hard. And this, we can see this is hard for Jesus. This is a trial and Satan tempts him and says, turn these stones into bread. You can feed yourself. He's like, Go back into the, you, you, you get to have your needs met. You can, you can get away from the limitations of a human body. And then he says, if you want to have all the power and all the possessions and all the glory, just worship me once and it, I'll give it to you. You can have all the success you want out here in the dust. And then he says, if God's really God, throw yourself off the building and see if he'll catch you. It seems like he would. He said he would. See if he's right or not. He tempts Jesus to defend God, to defend his picture of God by disobeying him. He tempts him with a noble idea, just like he did with Eve, when he said, don't you want to be like God? God doesn't want you to be like God. And she fell for it. And Jesus conquers where Eve did not. And he, we are the better for it. And look at the condition in which Jesus returns. It says, 
and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the what? Spirit. And what is spirit? Breath. He returns full of the breath of God. He goes and faces down sin, faces down temptation, faces down a counterfeit offer for cheap life and says, nope, I'm living inside of this. I am living inside the breath of God. He comes back. He goes into the temple. They hand him the scroll. He reads it and it says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he drops the mic and sits down and says, today I fulfilled this for you. Now all of the longing, all of the desire, he's not just fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. He is fulfilling everything we've ever longed for in this moment. He's faced down this counterfeit life. He's faced down life out in the wilderness. He's faced down the dust and the way we want to live in that and get stuck in that and said, nope, there is a better way. And the way is to bring all my limitations into the power of the Father, into the power of his breath in my life. The breath of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. The good news is you don't have to live confined always to what your dust says you must. Instead, the breath of God fills us and leads us and moves us towards something beautiful. He calls, Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of this word. I am it. He steps into the endless aching frustration of life as dust the monotony, the boredom, the loneliness, and he holds firmly to the breath of life and emerges triumphant and carrying enough breath of life for all of us. So look at this conversation. Now we're back in the Gospel of John and Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night because he is afraid of the rulers around him. And it says this, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, truly, truly. Every time Jesus says truly, truly, pay attention. It's like when your mom said, listen, listen, listen. Jesus is always emphasizing it when he says it twice. Truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. It's a good question. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time to be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the what? Spirit. Flesh is born of flesh, but spirit is born of spirit. Listen to this. The um. Do not be amazed that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Do you hear what it sounds like to live life in the Spirit? The wind comes. We don't know where it's coming or where it's going. It's wildly free. It's emphatically free. It's beautiful. It does crazy things and you can't control it. It's not like life as dust, which just just sits and does nothing. Our dust is meant to be a container for the wild life of the Holy Spirit that pushes us out into a world, pushes us out into places that we wouldn't otherwise probably choose to go because we are filled with something that makes us totally emphatically alive. And that is the way you want to wake up in the morning. That is what you want to feel to say, I am tired of just waking up and going, how do I feel today? Uh, kind of yucky. I'm just going to go back to bed. That's life as just dust. Life in the spirit says, wake up, breathe in a big breath of the life of God and say, where are we going today? What are we doing today? What does life look like today? I think it often looks wild and free. Like beauty grows wild in a garden. Um, Raspberries grow wild if you let them go. They just take over everything. We've got a bunch of raspberry bushes in the common areas in our neighborhood and people will be picking them, just bringing their buckets and picking them because they don't want those things growing wild in their yard. (laughs) So they go to where they are and they pick them and they just take over everything. And I think that is kind of the life that is filled with the spirit. You don't know what's gonna happen next, but you know it's gonna be good. You don't know what's gonna, it's, it's gonna be good. 
I want to be the kind of church where when we walk in on Sunday, we're like, what might happen today? What could happen? Will someone be healed? Will somebody be made whole? Will someone be freed? Will someone find a friend? Will someone find new life? Will someone find Jesus? That's how life in the spirit ought to be. I know we sit in these neat and tidy little rows, but that's not the Holy Spirit. This is the Greco-Roman Empire actually right here. This is how they taught us to do church. But how Jesus taught us to do church is the spirit blows on you. You don't know where it's going or where it's coming from, but man, it's great. I know, I know you guys, I'm a lot today. <laughs> that really wasn't a cheap uh, need for applause. Um, so Jesus says, life in the spirit is always better than trying to recreate life in a desert of your own making. You weren't meant to live only as dust. You were meant to live as dust and breath. And that is the good life. So then we move on to John 20. This is after Jesus has died. He's been resurrected, but the disciples don't know what's going on yet. So they have locked themselves in a room because they're afraid of the Jewish leaders who just killed Jesus. They're afraid. They're up there trembling in fear. Does that sound like a wild spirit-breathed life? No, it sounds kind of awful. So they're up there hiding and Jesus comes into the room <laughs> apparently that's life in the spirit. You don't need doors. He comes into the room and he says this to them. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so also I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Please imagine with me what it must be like to have the risen Jesus come through a door and breathe the Holy Spirit onto you. Imagine that life. I think it's available. He breathes the promise of the Holy Spirit to them, and then the Holy Spirit shows up in Acts 2. But where do we live? We're after Acts 2. We live in the land of the Holy Spirit. We live in the garden of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available to us. We can breathe him in anytime we choose. The Holy Spirit is here and good. And Jesus said, he breathes it on them. The breath of the risen Jesus transfers this, gives them new life, new hope, and new purpose in their old dust. He gives them a new view on their own limitations. He shows them they can throw themselves into the arms of God and let the Spirit move wildly through them. And he does. Read Acts. They heal the sick, they raise the dead, they cast out demons, they live in the beauty of the breath of God because dust plus breath equals life. Yesterday, I was in line at a food truck and I think I've preached here enough for you to know how much I love lines. I'm not great about them. Um, but I was in line at a food truck and all my friends were in a building having a party and my grandbaby was in the building and I just wanted to get back to them. I wanted to, I wanted to be with them and it was raining and I was like Beaverton and I'm standing there and I've been studying this and that'll get you in trouble. Never study anything. That's my, my advice to you. Never ever study because the minute you do, um, so I was standing there and all of a sudden I had this thought, even here, you can breathe in the life of God. Even here, you are just a breath away from the breath of the Holy Spirit. And so I took a minute and I just <sighs> breathed in the Holy Spirit, the life of God. And I said, why am I here in this line? What do I have to bring to this line? What do I have to bring to Beaverton? Is this a time for me and you? Is what I wanna live in the contentment of the breath of God. I don't wanna live in frustration and anger and whatever because I can't get back soon enough to the party. This is the party now. Wherever your breath is, that's where the party is. That's a song, right? That's where the party's at. Um, so we... If we asked everyone in this room, what is your purpose? What do you think your mission is? What are your gifts, your talents, your vision statement for your life? We get hundreds of answers. And I, I wanna be kind of careful about how much we pile on people inside the church about you need to change the world. We tell stories about Wilberforce and 
all the people who, Amy Carmichael, all the people who made this huge impact on their world, but let's start here that the thing I know you are called to, I know your purpose, your purpose in life and the purpose for your limitations is to draw you to Jesus, is for relationship with Jesus, it's to make you commune with Jesus, it's to turn to him with all your limitations. It's to have all of those things bring you back to him, friendship with him. That's his purpose and it becomes alive in us. It starts with awareness. It starts with breathing in his good purpose, breathing in his presence and listening. What are we gonna do today? How are we gonna live today? What do you wanna tell me today? It starts there. Whenever I read about the Garden of Eden, it sounds magical to me. It's fruit and flowers and animals and probably really good weather, I'm guessing. No sin, no shame, no fear, no heartache. But bigger than all of that is that the garden is where the presence of God is rich and true and beautiful. It's where he walks with creation in the cool of the day. It's where his imprint on their lives is crystal clear. That's the Garden of Eden. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of purpose with him. And so this is the point in the message where I should probably give you a list of things you should do in order to do this. Read your Bible, go through the Romans road, fast, commit an hour a week to pray, commit an hour a day to pray, commit 22 hours a day to pray, all the things you could do to do something and achieve something and become something. But I'm not gonna do that now because I don't want to. Because what if for this one week, what if the only to-do list you have for this one week is to find your place as dust and breath? in front of him. Just let him show you who you are as just dust and breath and Imago Dei. Let him speak life, breathe life into the shadowy corners of your soul. Let him tell you how you're enough for anything that he has for you. You're already as you are enough. You are a work of love. You are the creation of his hand. You are the planting of the Lord. All you have to do to thrive in his garden is sit with him and say, what next? How do I hear you? How do I respond to you? How do I joyfully submit to my own limitations so that you can come fully alive in me? I wonder if you might think for a minute, if your life is a garden and the garden has all kinds of things, Um, relationships and vocation and family and money, all the things that make up the garden of who you are. Where in your garden do you feel most alive today? You can maybe point to an area of success or harvest. And where in your garden do you feel, that part's not thriving, that part feels dusty, That feels like a little wilderness has snuck into the garden idea. And then ask yourself, how close do you feel to the breath of God? Because I can promise you you're close. You're just a deep inhale away from the presence of God. Turn off the music in your car and breathe in deep. Take a minute in the quiet of your house or your office or walking in your garden and breathe deep. Let him speak to you. Let him meet you there. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you for being the tender of the gardens of our soul. We ask God for every seed that is struggling for life today that you would be the breath of life and the Prince of Peace. God, for those who feel just a moment away from despair, I ask you would meet them even now that they would feel the breeze on their face as you walk near them. Holy Spirit, you are our treasure. We thank you for access to your presence. We ask that you would be with us this week as we become people who get accustomed to the sound of your voice and the breath of your spirit. 
We love you and worship you in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, will you stand with me? We're going to close with a benediction. I want to also say that while I was praying, I just felt the word despair so strongly in my spirit and that someone here is really in such deep despair that maybe you've had thoughts of giving up entirely. And if that is you, please will you not please will you not leave here until we can pray with you. That is not what God wants for you or your life. Okay, benediction. Um, hands up if you'd like to receive a benediction. May you be men and women who know the perfection of limitations and the power of living filled with the breath of God. May you embrace the beauty of dust plus breath as you learn to live always in the garden of his goodness. Amen. We love you so much. And we have a treat today. There are pancakes after the second service. So this is pre-lunch. Have some pancakes. We'll see you next weekend. We love you.